Casey's View Spot, number 24, almost feels like a coup because it is an honor and a privilege to be chatting with Ms. Montserrat Facius Vie, Chief Team Mission of the UNHCR in India. In fact, Ms. Vie is such a busy person that this chat is being taken in the vehicle, taking us to the airport to drop her back to Delhi, where she is based. Thank you, Ms. Vie, for appearing in Casey's View Spot. I will not be asking you about what the UNHCR does in India because an interested viewer will just have to Google the website to know more, to get to know more uh, info on that. Uh, rather, this is going to be more about you. I hope you're okay with that. That's fine. Okay. The first question is, uh, can you give a brief background of yourself before you joined the UNHCR? It will be very brief because I joined UNHCR when I was very young. Okay. I was barely 21. Yeah. I was still a student and I joined UNHCR because I was looking for a job yeah. to, you know, uh, to pay for my studies. Yeah. So I was working and studying at the same time. Yeah. So before UNHCR, I was a baby to speak of. Oh. So there isn't much of a past before UNHCR. Okay. So oh, what, where were you studying? Which country are you from? I was from? studying in Geneva. Yeah. I was studying political science. Okay. And uh, I was, you know, working and studying at the same time. Working and studying. So that means to get to your stage in life, we uh, somebody has to join very young, I guess. You know, so that they get the sort of experience. I don't know. I think that you know, uh, I was very young. I was very privileged that I yeah. was able to find this job in HCR yeah. because I think it's the best possible job one can get because it's a very interesting one. one it's very fulfilling, so I was very privileged myself. Uh, you know, your name is a little mysterious. I mean, we don't know exactly where you're from. I mean, you studied in Switzerland, you're saying. Uh -huh. So that would be more, you know, French. Yeah. Actually, uh, I come from Catalonia. Okay, that's which Spain. Is, uh, so, so actually, it's uh, split. There is one part in Spain, one part in France. Okay. So my uh, my name, myself, I'm, you know, it's a Catalan name. I'm a Catalan. And, okay. Uh, that is my language. Okay. And I, uh, you know, I have lived in France, in Spain, in Switzerland, in many countries. So you must be knowing a lot of languages. Yeah? Well, uh, by European standards, probably yes. Yeah. But in India, I've learned that everybody speaks, you know, any number of languages. So I'm very humbled uh, as compared <laughs> to the Indians. So. But just to, you know, get the viewer to know how many languages, you know, can you just tell five, us? Five, basically five languages. Five languages. That's French, Catalan, Spanish, yeah. English, and Italian. Wow, <laughs> it's really a lot. Now, uh, uh, what you've already said, uh, you haven't told us what made you interested in joining the UNHCR, and I'd like to know when you joined. Yes, well, as I said, I joined when I was just 21. Mm -hmm. uh, initially, it was a coincidence. There was an opening there. Yeah. They were looking for somebody who could speak the languages that I was speaking. Uh, Mainly they wanted somebody to speak French, Spanish and English. Yeah. I met the requirement and so they took me in on a short term um, basis. Yeah. And then little by little, you know, I became a regular staff and, and did a career in UNHCR. Okay. Um, uh, what are the places you have served in the UNHCR? And can you give a brief description of the challenges you faced in each of these places? Well, the first place was Geneva, as yeah. I mentioned, when I joined. Yeah. Um, the challenge was, you know, um, trying to do both a good job in the office while also, you know, uh, performing well at university. So that was a big challenge. I think I managed, but it did take a lot of effort. Yeah. Um, then I went to Sudan. Yeah. I was in Sudan at the time of uh, the big drought in Ethiopia. And the challenge there was to learn, you know, to do my best in a very difficult environment because there were many people who were literally starving, many people who died, lots of children dying. Which year would this be? That was in 84. 84, okay. And it was extremely, extremely difficult for me. I had never been out of Europe and you know, to be confronted with so much suffering and so yeah. much death. Yeah. That was you know, a very difficult, also a very good lesson. I learned a lot. I, you know, I'm full of admiration for the people who went through all this ordeal and who survived it, many of them, yeah. many who couldn't. Yeah. So uh, that was that was the number one place. Then I went to Central America. I yeah. was in, uh, in Honduras. Yeah. And that was also very interesting. I was first working in the in the border area with El Salvador, where there was a civil war. Okay. And again, that was very challenging because uh, the war was ongoing, and from the refugee camp we could hear the bombs dropping, and we knew what it meant. You know, each bomb dropping and the, the killing and the suffering that each of them would, you know, yeah. would impart. Later, I was transferred to work on the another part of the country, on the border of Nicaragua, 
uh, I was then in the jungle. But, uh, that was extremely, uh, I would say, extremely rewarding because uh, it coincided with the end of the conflict in Nicaragua and we were able to see the beginning of the return of the refugees to Nicaragua. So that was very nice. Okay. Uh, also, the place was very, uh, very simple. Uh, mm -hmm. We lived in the middle of the jungle. There was no water, no electricity. There were no roads. Yeah. But I found it extremely satisfying because we were really with the people, sharing their lives, their concerns, you know, the same challenges and hardships. So I really enjoyed it. It's one of the places that I have the finest memories of. Yeah, I find that uh, you really had to work in really tough places. Um, and especially sometimes even your life might be in danger. How do you cope in situations like that? You know, I think that when you do something that you enjoy doing, uh, you don't see it as a problem so much. It's a challenge, but you know, one that you actually quite welcome and that you know it makes you, I would say, better for it. Yeah. So for me, it was not a problem. Really. I, I enjoyed it very much. Uh, what's the place that you served in just before coming to India? I was in Uganda. Uganda. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and uh, what were the challenges there? In Uganda, the challenges were that uh, there was, uh, on the one hand, a refugee situation yeah. that was uh, complex, but I would say altogether under control. But then, at the same time, we had an internally displaced situation. Okay. There were two million people internally displaced in the country okay. and 200,000 refugees. Mm -hmm. And the internally displaced people had really a very hard time. Okay. They had many problems of security, the conflict with the uh, group called the Lord's Resistance Army was ongoing. Mm -hmm. They had uh, terrible practices mm -hmm. in terms of human rights and what they would do to children, to women, to, to everybody was truly atrocious. And so uh, people were suffering a lot. Yeah. So I thought that was, uh, that was really a big challenge. Fortunately, over the time that I was in Uganda, there was an improvement in the situation and many of the people were able to go back home. So that was actually very positive. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, before you, I come to asking you about your uh, challenges in India, uh, have you been to places like uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan? Yes, uh, yes, I have worked with Afghan refugees uh, yeah. oh. based in Pakistan okay. for a number of years. So oh. I was able to to be both in Pakistan and Afghanistan. Yeah, those are very... And that was again a very, very challenging, challenging operation yeah. because the numbers were huge. Yeah. When uh, I was there, there were more than two million refugees in two Pakistan. Million, yeah. That was huge. They were living in uh, sometimes some very difficult areas. Yeah. In the, close to the border where there was no water, extreme temperatures, um, very, very demanding, you know, physically and uh, I would say psychologically demanding. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, again, it was rewarding because it was uh, quite encouraging to see how, how people could be so uh, courageous and so resourceful, you know, to make the best out of it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know I said I wouldn't ask you about the UNHCR as an organization, but you know, to someone who really doesn't know, what would you say the UNHCR does to help alleviate the sufferings of the refugee in general? Well, the first uh, element really is the what we call protection, making sure that people are safe. Okay. That's the most important thing. Yeah. And the first element is making sure that they are allowed to seek asylum. So when they go to a country, people, you know, fleeing mm -hmm. from a conflict that they they look for asylum, so the first thing is to make sure that they are allowed to yeah. remain in that country. That's yeah. number one. Yeah. The second one, also very important, is that they are allowed to remain there, that they are not forcibly sent back to their own country okay. or a country where they will be in danger. So that is really the main task of the Okay. And of course we help governments a lot because we are not a government, we don't have an army, so our work is one of persuasion, one is, you know, of trying to to promote refugee So you've got to be principles. very diplomatic and so we try to work with, with them, all parties, you know, to yeah. convince yeah. countries to accept refugees and to do, you know, to protect them. Yeah. And then depending on the situation, we also provide things like healthcare or water or food or sanitation. It depends. In the case of India, we don't have to do that because the government takes care of it. Okay. But in some countries, like you know, for instance, in Pakistan, we were running refugee camps where we had to provide everything okay. from food to water to shelter to education to healthcare, everything. Okay. So it really depends on, uh, on the country in which we are working. Why would you say that there's a, for those who don't know, why would you say there's a difference uh, between Pakistan and India where the Indian government takes care of everything here? Uh, 
the, uh, you know, you're allowed to, the UNHCR is allowed to function uh, almost so in you know, autonomous I think each country is different. And I yeah. think the decisions are made at a given time for particular reasons. Yeah. In the case of India, UNHCR works mainly with urban refugees. Okay. So there is no issue about them being in camps. Mm -hmm. um, India also has resources and decided at the time of the arrival of some refugees, like the Sri Lankan refugees or the Tibetan refugees, that they would make land available and they would allow them to settle there. Okay. The numbers also were, I would say, as compared to other operations, not that huge. Okay. As I mentioned, in the case of Pakistan, yeah. talking about more than 10 years ago, yeah. over 2 million refugees. Okay. In the case of India, we talk about much smaller figures. So yeah. it's not quite comparable. I okay. think that different times, different places, different situations. Okay. Now, coming to the question on India, uh, what are the challenges that you faced here as, as a chief? Well, here in India, one challenge is that uh, there is no law on refugees. Okay. So, on the one hand, India is an extremely generous country because yeah. it's hosting lots of refugees yeah. and it's, you know, really very generous with them and providing a lot for them. Yeah. But because there is no law, that means that there is no system. Yeah. And so, um, different refugees get different treatment. Okay. Um, it's based on ad hoc decisions, often at the time of arrival, and of course it creates a sort of a vacuum in which we are operating. Mm -hmm. But again, we try to make the best of it because the bottom line is that the refugees overall are doing reasonably well. Yeah. Because the government is generous, the government is welcoming, and so are the people. I think it's important to mention that Indian people are extremely generous to the refugees. Yeah. I think that there is, it's part of their psyche. I think that we don't have to to spend a lot of time explaining to people who is a refugee because people know. Yeah. Partly because of Indians, India's own past. Yeah. But people, are, people understand and there's a lot of sympathy towards refugees and that makes our job much easier. Okay. Yeah. You know, you said that uh, India doesn't have a legal framework. Uh, does the UNHCR try convincing the uh, Indian government to have this legal framework? I think whether convincing is the right word, but yeah. you know, UNHCR as a whole, not yeah. necessarily in India as such, but overall, yeah. we try to persuade governments yeah. to sign the 1951 Convention on the Status of Refugees because that convention actually yeah. you know, specifies and describes both the rights and duties and provides a legal framework for refugees. Yeah. Then after the convention has been signed, then of course we encourage countries to adopt laws on refugees so that there is again a clear framework about okay. the rights and duties of refugees in the country. Okay. Um, I know, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm still going back to what the UNHCR in India does, but what are the uh, refugees, uh, who are the refugees that you have to handle? Well, there are many refugees in India. Uh, yeah. The largest group is, of course, the Tibetan refugees, okay. then the Sri Lankan refugees, yeah. and then the others, which are mostly urban refugees, mainly based in Delhi. Yeah. Uh, the largest group it comes from Afghanistan. Okay. Then we also have refugees who come from Myanmar. Mm -hmm. Then we have smaller groups who come from the Middle East, from Africa. You know, there's a variety uh, okay. in their origins. Okay. And we work with them in uh, making sure that they are safe, that they are protected, that they have access to services, and they can make a living in India until there is a chance for them to go back home. Um, I'd also uh, like to go away from the UNHCR for a bit uh -huh. and ask you what are your interests in, in life? In life. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, um, I like uh, doing academic research um, on all matters related to migration. I was one of people. Yeah. Then, in terms of you know fun, I uh, I like music. I like photography. Okay. Uh, what, what, what do you like uh, to photograph? Well, uh, I used to do a lot of landscapes, but in fact what I like to do mostly is portraits. Okay. Because I like to engage, you know, with people and, okay. and see them, you know, in the, in the portraits. So have you I had like exhibitions that very much. of yours? Uh, well, in the past, uh, but I have to say that lately I um, don't have so much time. But whenever I have some free time, I like to do you that, do that. Yes, okay. very much. Yeah. And then, you know, I like to do sport and uh, I like to what walk. Sort of, what, what sort of sport? I like swimming. Yeah, okay. Uh, I also like to do yoga. Oh, okay. Uh, and uh, I like to play cards. <laughs> okay. Which, which, which one? I like to play bridge. Bridge, okay. Uh, so, uh, but you know, yeah, uh, that's when time uh, permits, I yes, guess. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You might, I'm sure you don't have too much of time these not days. Not much, not much. Yeah, but, uh, to indulge in all that. Now, what advice would you give someone who wants to follow in your footsteps? I 
think it's important to do something, something that really motivates you, something in which you believe. Because, you know, it's very difficult to maintain your enthusiasm sometimes. I was saying that overall things have gone well in many operations, but there has also been some difficult moments. And so I think it's important that you truly believe in what you are doing, because that, that's what keeps you going sometimes. I, you know, uh, uh, yes, I guess what I would advise somebody, you know, to do something that really you enjoy doing, and really invest yourself and believe in what you are doing. Because th then it's easy, then it's not a challenge, it's not a problem, you just do it because it's a pleasure for you to do it. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, you know, I, I just have one final question and this is how I normally sign off. Uh, do you have anything to say to anyone on anything? It's just your wish, you know, it's your time to just say you know, whatever I you want. Think I often have young people who approach me yeah, and yeah. they want to ask for advice, you know, yeah. what can we do to, you know, get a job like yours or, yeah. or do something in this field or in some other field. Okay. And for me, uh, there are two things. I think the yeah. advice is one is work hard. Okay. I think That's that is very important advice. to work hard. Yeah. And the other one, it's never to lose hope. Yeah. I think it's important to always retain hope. Even when you're going through a difficult time. Yeah. Because things somehow always get better at one point or another. Thank you, Ms. Way, uh, for you know appearing in Casey's View Spot. I really appreciate it because I know how time is of the essence for you. And I hope at, at some stage in life I can do this again. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure.